do the same thing. Airplanes are for multi. The hour of 11.30 having arrived, the Santa Cruz City Council meeting for October 22nd, 2024 is called to order, and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Palantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder? Here. And Mayor Keeley? Here. Uh, we are on statements of disqualification. <laughs> Any member have a disqualification you need to notice at this point? Uh, we uh, are on... Uh, public comment on our closed session. We have some items on closed session, items uh, under item one. We have six items there. Uh, we have a conference with legal counsel uh, as well. Does anyone wish to make comment on our closed session agenda before we adjourn into that closed session? Let me see if there's anyone online, Ms. Bush. Anyone with their hand raised? Nobody with their hand raised. No one with their hand raised. So the way we will proceed is we will adjourn now into closed session. We will return from closed session no earlier than 12.05 p.m. We stand adjourned into closed session. Mayor, really quick, if I could Excuse just announce, me. we yes, do please. have two people of the members of the public signed in. We need them to log off um, the meeting. Oh, please do. So those of you that are online, please log off uh, so that we can go into closed session. We appreciate your cooperation in that regard. We good, Ms. Bush? Yes, we still have Owen Lawler signed on. Mr. Lawler, if you would log, log off, that would be great. I can't put him out. We're good. We're good. Thank you very much. We are in, uh, adjourned into closed session. The hour of 12.05 having arrived and the council having completed its business in closed session, we are back in open session and the clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Helen Torrey Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder is currently absent and Mayor Keeley? Present.
quorum having been established, we will move to oral communication. This will be the opportunity for anyone to address us on a matter under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda, for a period of time not to exceed two minutes. In the event that we have folks both here and online, what we will do is toggle back and forth. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome. Mayor and the City Council members. Uh, I'm Stephen Bosworth. I live on uh, Pacific Mall, uh, Pacific Avenue North. Um, I, by now, I trust you will have received a document uh, in connection with the request that uh, several of us made two weeks ago uh, regarding wishing you to set up a commission to consider all the pros and cons of establishing ranked choice voting instead of the current system. The, uh, the main argument for that, we think, but we would like that commission to test that, that this claim, that this would have a number of advantages instead of the some 15 uh, percent of the, pop, of the voting population that you would represent. Instead, you would, you would be representing almost 90 percent of that voting population. It would also save money in that you would not any longer have to have uh, 10 yearly uh, district reformations, uh, and you would not have to have primary elections. And the, the great thing is that many more of the citizens would feel that they are invested in your, in your proceedings because they would see one of you as one that they had preferred. Uh, so I'm hoping that uh, you, you will do this. We were requesting this in response to advice given to us by the general secretary, general, sorry, the attorney general, who when we, knowing that he is in favor of ranked choice voting or open to ranked choice voting as a solution for the Cal under the California Voting Rights Act, he advised us that we should first try remedy, local remedies. And this request that we are making to you is that step in that direction. We hope that you will consider these arguments for and against in this commission and uh, come up with a, uh, we hope, the more democratic solution. Thank you for listening. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Do we have anyone online, Ms. Bush? We'll take the first person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the city council meeting. Person online. Person online. Three, two, one. Mr. Ewing, good afternoon, sir. Welcome. Thank you. What would we do without technology? I'd be mm. quite happy if it all disappeared I, I will back to the 1840s. A, uh, rhetorical question. <laughs> well, some technology is better than others, so time 159, not 2, not 3, not 17. Okay. I was listening to something. Um, on Brighton, Mike Adams was interviewing Dr. Shiva, and the title was Dr. Shiva Unleashes Truth Bombs on Zionist Servants Trump, JFK Jr., Kamala, Biden, and Stein. Really interesting hour and a half dialogue, truly fascinating. So, you know, I gave blood today. American Red Cross would never take their blood. It's disgusting. That's just one of the many disgusting corporations, you know due to the recent uh, Hurricane Helene, American Red Cross made a statement that there is no contamination with the individuals who've had the latest vaccinations the last three and a half years and people who haven't. We all are in this together because that nanotechnology is everywhere. People's shit jumps on me all the time, but I still engage. So, uh, I don't know. There's other things to comment on later. Um, 50 seconds. Now I'm going to pull that off on the consent agenda. So that's enough for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ewing. Do we have anyone else online, Ms. Bush? We do. I can confirm that the people via Zoom can hear them. It's an audio thing on my end, on my computer. So if it doesn't work, I'm still working on it. Okay. So should I call on someone now? Online? Sure. Mm -hmm. Next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the city council meeting. We'll come back to him. 
we'll, we'll come back. Good afternoon, welcome. Hello, good afternoon. Hello. <clears throat> this Tuesday, myself and other community members observed what the city and CP SCPD call a humane sweep of the residents of Poganip. In the past, these sweeps have been performed citing environmental health concerns over lead contamination in the ground, which allowed them to forcefully displace the residents of Poganip with heavy machinery and armed officers. Residents were caused a great distress and many would have been unable to fully move their stuff without help. This would have led to a loss of shelter, food, clothing, and personal items, possibly threatening their lives. Residents of Poganip have also reported to us that they saw a drone flying over them seemingly being used to count or monitor them, a claim we believe considering we saw a drone in operation during the raid in Poganip on July 29th. On June 28th, the Supreme Court decided that it no, was no longer against the Eighth Amendment for cities and localities to ban sleeping in public, even if people had nowhere else to go. In California, Gavin Newsom only exacerbated the problem by doubling down, announcing his executive order to sweep all dangerous encampments on California state property on July 25th. Since then, living homeless in America has only gotten more dangerous. With the legal protections completely removed, states and localities no longer have to worry about violating a constitutional amendment and can now act with the impunity they've been waiting for. Before then, the state of California claimed that officials provided social services before forceful displacement and threatening individuals with arrest, services which were not offered on October 15th. The lack of medical, mental health, and social resources given to the residents of Poganip is exemplary of the police-centered model for forceful displacement in Santa Cruz. This model and its issues would only be made worse by constructing a regional public safety training facility as requested by Fire Chief Rob Odie. Thank you. Thank you. Online, Ms. Bush, or are we still, still having a little it. trouble? I'm sorry, I just missed that. Are we still having a little trouble with the online? I'm still working on it. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, City Council members, what citizens want you to understand is that the residents and community of the city of Santa Cruz can see right through what's transpiring here. Santa Cruz, it was a master class in achieving the same repression as other more conservative areas of the country while managing to package it in a way that leads people to believe it is a necessary good for the community. Currently, the project is listed as a climate action plan under the capital improvement plan, which is comical considering the amount of land excavation needed for a public safety training center would cause great harm to our climate. We know that $2 million have been all all allocated to the project and that Fire Chief Rob Odie believes a joint facility with UCSC would be in everyone's best interest. But the location for the facility still stays TBD. Building a cop training facility on a campus where over 150 cops just brutalized the Santa Cruz community this past May and continue to intimidate students and faculty over their anti-genocide work would lead to increased danger to the student body and community. We should not strengthen a UC police department that has deep issues of racism, sexism, transphobia, and general brutality. We ask you now to turn away from past repression and brutality by rejecting the public safety training center. This center would only lead to over-policing in Santa Cruz, strengthen the corrupt UCPD, and harm our local climate. Please take the path of funding real social services like housing, food, health care, and child care which is far more likely to decrease crime than policing. Please reject the Public Safety Training Center. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Mr. Tim Thompson, good afternoon. Good morning, or I guess good afternoon. Good afternoon, Santa Cruz City Council. Uh, my name is Joe Thompson. Uh, I live in District 5, um, and I'm here today on behalf of Baymac. I want to thank, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak, and thank you to our Mayor, Fred Keeley, uh, for graciously meeting with me and a few others last week. I also want to thank uh, Councilmember uh, Talon Trey Johnson and Renee Golder, although she's not here, uh, for being at the community meeting uh, for Westcliff Drive last night. That was a great event, so thank you for all, all the work you guys do. Um, on behalf of BAMEC, uh, the Bay Area Municipal Elections Committee, uh, I am speaking in support of ranked choice voting. 
uh, we are asking the council to form a subcommittee to explore ranked choice voting and other improvements to our city's electoral system. BAMEC has unanimously endorsed ranked choice voting because it will, one, move elections to the general election where we have more diverse voter turnout, and two, it has shown to remove barriers for more LGBTQ candidates to run for office and achieve elected office. Please stand with the Bay Area Municipal Elections Committee and Santa Cruz LGBTQ community and move ranked choice voting forward. Um, if you have any questions or would like to meet, have a meeting to discuss this opportunity um, and meet with BAMEC to kind of show you like what we're looking for and have these you know open discussions, we want it to be a community process um, and have these kind of, you know, like the West Cliff Drive meetings, have an open discussion in public about what the city is looking for, how we can make sure um, these new districts are the most representative for the city council, um, and how we can move forward and, and make sure everyone's voices is heard in our local government. Um, and I just want to know, I've, I've only done this twice, this is my second time speaking at uh, open oral communications. Uh, I, I sometimes will chime in to comment on, on agenda items, uh, but usually I don't show up and speak at oral communications. So thank you for, for listening um, to me and all the other people that spoke. It, it really means a lot to have this ability to speak to you on issues that we really care about. So thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Good afternoon. Welcome. You've already heard a few people comment about the project called the Regional Public Safety Training Center. I just want to make it abundantly clear that you cannot fund such a project, especially at UCSC. The reason seems, at least to me, fairly obvious. As you know, earlier this year in May, our administration unleashed approximately 500 law enforcement officers on students. A lot of people were injured. Some were permanently injured. That decision physically and materially altered the rest of their lives. People were nearly killed and we're honestly very lucky that nobody died. If this training center is funded, that would invite way more police to campus. And I think that would be distasteful after the extreme force that students faced from law enforcement less than five months ago. I guarantee you that those people who were permanently harmed and anyone who cares about them will make it their life's work to stop that project from going any further. None of us want future students to suffer the same fate. None of us. You will not fund the Regional Public Safety Training Center. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Ms. Wood online with their hand raised. All right. Anyone else wish to comment under oral communications? Mayor, Seen, yes. may I? Certainly, Ms. Brown. I, I recognize that this is not a time when we generally respond to the public, but I, I do want to, in this case, uh, we've had people come to speak to us about ranked choice voting and specifically evaluative proportional representation. Uh, those who were on the council previously know that I am a big supporter of exploring this and I believe it didn't get a real hearing um, due to the politics at the time. So with that, I'd like to make a motion that, the, uh, that we place on a future agenda uh, consideration of the uh, establishment of a committee to explore ranked choice voting uh, with engagement from the public. There is a motion. Is there a second? Motion dies for lack of a second. We are on presiding officer announcements. I have none. Statements of disqualification. Anyone have a disqualification on the agenda, either consent or otherwise? Additions and deletions. Ms. Wood, any additions or deletions? No. Thank you. Madam City Attorney, any additions? additions or deletions? No. The understanding, however, is that if you were here on item, let me get to it, give me a moment. You are here on the item, item 18 relating to the homeless garden project. That item has been removed from the agenda. Uh, on a previous action uh, uh, within the last day or so. Uh, city Attorney report, Madam City Attorney, any reports from closed session? Yes. Uh, Council met in closed session in the courtyard conference room. Item one on the closed session agenda was a conference with legal counsel related to liability claims, and those claims are noted in the closed session agenda. And I would note that the same claims are also on your open session agenda, item nine. Item two on the closed session agenda was a conference with legal counsel regarding a significant exposure to litigation, and no reportable action was taken on that item. Thank you. 
We are on item. We are on item three, uh, Madam uh, City Clerk. Do we have any items you'd like to draw to our attention on future agendas? No. Thank you very much. We are on consent agenda. For those of you who might be unfamiliar with this, we will be taking up items four through fourteen, inclusive on one motion. What I will do is give the opportunity for council members to comment on an item, pull an item, et cetera. Uh, we'll then give the public the opportunity to make comments on the consent agenda. If you are going to be making a comment on the consent agenda, you should make all of your comments at one time on the, uh, on the consent agenda. Let me start with, yes. Certainly. Sorry, that went so fast. So right. I have a statement of disqualification for item number 16 as it relates to my employment. I also wondered if we might just take one minute and just briefly outline anticipated agenda item times. I see people here for the ADU ordinance item, which is not until after 3, 3.30. What, I, I'm sorry, what is your question? Um, <laughs> I see people here for the ADU ordinance item on the agenda, which is towards the end of the agenda. Yes. And I wonder if there's an estimated time we can share so they're not sitting here if they don't need to um, for hours. Well, uh what I'll say is we have time estimates on the agenda. It's the best estimate we have. This looks like it might come up around 4 o'clock. I want to be very careful. We could take this up. We're going in order, in sequence. Don't rely on me telling you it might not come up before 4 o'clock. Do not do that. We're going to go through our agenda in the regular order of things. Further, Council Member Newsom on the consent agenda. No comments, Mayor. Councilmember Brown on the consent agenda. Nothing, thanks. Councilmember Watkins on the consent agenda. None for me. Councilmember Bruner. None for me, thank you. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Yeah, I comment on 12. Thank you. Please proceed. Great. So this is the um, the 800 block of West Cliff. Um, there was um, some. Um, lack of uh, understanding around what this item was. So I just want to clarify that this it, item is just to approve the issuing of an RFP to procure a consultant team and then to do a budget adjustment for the new project. Um, there aren't any plans at this time for the city to purchase Lighthouse Field um, State Park. Um, if we move forward with this, with this project, a small portion will have to be procured and that will come to the council at a later date. So just wanted to clarify that for everyone. And also just take the opportunity to, again, thank public work staff and all the departments that are doing a tremendous amount of work on Westcliff um, and the departments that showed up last night to the Westcliff roadmap um, meeting and, and the community members for your involvement. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Vice Mayor is not present. This will be the opportunity for anyone to address us on an item on the consent agenda. This will be <clears throat> items 4 through 14 inclusive. Good afternoon, Mr. Ewing. Thank you, Mr. Keeley. Uh, my name is James Ewing Whitman. My, I'm not going to talk on number 6, the civil grand jury. I'm going to talk number 4, the minutes. Now, I was standing here on the 8th. When I got here late, I was listening to some people talk about the CARES Act, and the public wasn't allowed to make comments on that. Now, it's my understanding that uh, an individual that goes through the undergraduate degree and the graduate degree and does their 2,500 hours and get their master's in social work, and if they so decide, they can give somebody a 5150 or a 5250. Now, I recall... A year ago, I didn't take the time yet to go through the dialogue or my notes, but that person could identify this mic to give anybody a 5250. Now, it's my understanding also that law enforcement in California can recommend a 5150 to people. So I think it's, uh, gosh, I think it was really kind of criminal that um, the public couldn't make comments on that. But I don't know what else to say besides criminal really happy about that. I think that is a very strong issue. 
we have so many issues coming up with, you know, the bankruptcy of this country for what, the fifth time? Um, and what's going to happen when a lot more people become homeless and maybe get agitated and can't speak as peacefully as possible to people they have different civil agreements with and don't have the practice of uh, t talking their way out of conversations with supposed authority. So I guess my note is that that was really kind of annoying to me personally. I'm glad that I um, started recording when I was in line and I tried to talk to a few of the individuals, two of which weren't here yesterday, so, uh, the year before, so who knows. So that's about all I want to say right now. It's just kind of um, it's, it's pretty annoying. I'll leave it at that. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else on the consent agenda? Anyone online? Matters back before the body. What is the pleasure of the body? Councilmember Watkins moves the consent agenda. Councilmember Contar Johnson seconds. Is there debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Calentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder is currently absent. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. We're on general business. That would take us to item 15. This is an ordinance rescinding uncodified ordinance uh, 1440 and an ordinance establishing the Planning Commission and amending chapter 18.41.040, appointment to the Board of Building Permit Appeals and Length of Terms. Staff presentation, Marisol Gomez, Assistant Director of Finance, is going to present on this item. I don't see Marisol, but I can sort of explain it in her absence Certainly. if you would like. Thank you, Ms. Bush. Um, if you remember, we had updated a lot of the commission to mm -hmm. receive compensation, and there were two committees who specifically was spelled out that they could not be compensated for their duties, the Planning Commission um, and then the Historic Preservation. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was the Board of Building Appeal. Sorry, I'm not prepared for this. Um, so this is just to get everybody um, on the compensation piece of service. Very good. Thank you. Questions, comments? Anyone with us wish to comment on this item? Seeing here none, the matter is back before the body. Pleasure of the body. Ms. Brown? I'll move the recommendation. Ms. Brown moves the recommendation. Mr. Newsom seconds. Debate or discussion? Seeing here none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder is absent. And Mayor Keeley? All right. Motion passes and so ordered. We are on item 16, the downtown expansion plan, downtown density bonus, and anti-displacement policy. There's a staff report and recommendations in our packet. Ms. Noisy, senior planner, Mr. Van Waugh, principal planner, will be presenting on this item. Mr. Butler, good afternoon, sir. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development, and um, Matt and Sarah will be with us momentarily. I'll go ahead and get going on Thank this. Um, Bonnie, can we get the next slide? Clicker. All right, so Council will recall that um, we uh, received direction back in January of 23 to um, proceed with the downtown plan with a objective to meet three different standards. The first was the 12-story maximum building height. The second was 20% um, of new housing at below market rate. And um, that is the, the total amount of housing um, that is produced in that area. And the third was um, planning for 1,600 residential units and studying 1,800 residential units for the south of Laurel area. Um, we talked at the time about the state density bonus and how that has um, limitations on our ability to achieve those goals. 
that the council has set out for us, but that we can still work towards those goals. And um, that's what we have um, in our council presentation today. Um, the, the state density bonus can still be used. I want to be clear about that. And um, the state uh, density bonus does allow for um, exceeding of height limits, um, setbacks, and open space. Um, and it offers financial incentives to developers. And so the question or the, the challenge that we had before us was meeting those three objectives while still um, doing something that is going to be more attractive than the state density bonus. And so um, <clears throat> we are looking at um, how we can exceed the number of below market rate units as compared to the density bonus. So we'll talk about this a little bit more later in the presentation. But when state density bonus is applied, the overall percentage of affordable units in the project goes down. And we'll have the examples of that in, a few, in, in later slides so you can see that. Um, so one of the objectives from council, 20% of the total number of units. We've got a city downtown density bonus that, looks to, that seeks to achieve that. Um, second, we have um, an ability to regain additional local control through the um, approach, the downtown density bonus approach that the, uh, that's recommended before you today. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as well. And then um, this is an optional system. So a developer can still choose to use the state density bonus and um, what we have sought to do is make the downtown density bonus more attractive than the state density bonus. All right. Um, Matt, you want me to keep going or do you want to take it over? You want me to keep going? <laughs> I'll keep going. <laughs> um, so with the downtown density bonus, the developers agree to um, forego the state density bonus. You can't use both. If you're choosing to use our density bonus, then you're going to use that. Um, they are choosing to accept the density bonus in uh, relation to um, the floor area ratio, and we'll talk about that a little bit more um, momentarily. And then when we're talking about that um, regaining some of the local control, the developer would also voluntarily subject themselves to the architectural review committee um, review that um, can provide recommendations on building design and site design. And then that would then ultimately come before the city council for a decision. So if they choose this route, they're choosing a more discretionary route. Um, we need to still make this attractive to them so that they don't choose the state density bonus. And so we would put some bookends on that discretion because with the state density bonus, there is very little discretion, as council members are well aware. Um, and then um, we have, as of um, last week, um, if the council um, chooses to give direction and move forward in this approach, we have... Um, put together a planning commission subcommittee that can provide dis, uh, di uh, guidance and uh, design um, expertise on some very specific components. This is a very limited um, subcommittee. Um, we're thinking over the next few weeks, um, right before we get this um, uh, plan draft plan document out to assist us in helping, particularly with some of those subjective design criteria that um, the, that would then guide these development projects. Um, we are currently recommending that this apply to our, all parcels within the, um, uh, the downtown um, expansion area. And that is because the state density bonus applies in all parcels. Um, so 
this um, offers um, the, the best opportunity to meet those council objectives of achieving the 20% afford of, of affordable units and um, the 12-story um, height limit. Both of those in particular are directly affected by this. All right, um, so let's talk about the downtown density bonus now. Um, there are two options um, for the bonus. One is if you're staying below 85 feet in height, and the other is if you're staying below um, 145 feet in height. So there's an eight-story, 85-foot height limit that um, would allow you to get an unlimited floor area ratio um, if you use this approach. And then there is an uh, approach where if you wanted to go above that, uh, you could get a 75% floor area ratio bonus. Um, and council will recall that that 85 foot height limit is where construction materials change. So that's why that um, distinction is made in this. There are, um, when, we, when we talk about the, um, the downtown density bonus, there are three options that can uh, be utilized. The first is on-site, the second is off-site, and the third is in lieu. I'm gonna go through each of those uh, briefly here. <clears throat> so um, 150 um, units in a, um, a project that is built within the south of Laurel area, um, we would have um, 13.3% of those as low income units and 8% of those as moderate income units. This is based on the, the overall project. So, you know, in a density bonus project, you would typically have the base as 100 units and the density bonus project as 150 units, right? And the percentages that we apply are on the base project. What we are recommending here is that those percentages apply to the total number of units. And that's why you see the 13.3 and the 8%. And that gets us to the 21.3%. And you might ask, why is a developer going to choose this when they could do a similar project that is um, a 13.3% um, uh, below market rate? if they're using the state density bonus. And the answer lies in the levels of affordability. When you look at the uh, state density bonus, you'd have to do 15% of that base project as very low income, which is 50% AMI, and then you would have 5% at low income. And if you look at these, um, these affordability levels, it's 13.3% of the total um, at low income, 80% AMI, and 8% at moderate income, which is 110% um, AMI, area median income yeah, in this I've instance. Yeah, I've been crumpling the paper. Um, so 21.3% of that total. So that um, is the primary way in which we are able to achieve that, um, that direction from the council of getting to 20% at below market. The um, second approach that someone could use, and you'll notice you know, the, the green houses here are within that same development. In this second approach, the green houses here are in a, a separate project. So in this instance, if you've got 150 units um, on the project site in the downtown uh, plan expansion area, <laughs> you could do 26.7 um, of those off-site. You could do those off-site. So again, it's a higher percentage. You do, we want to do off-site. It's a higher percentage that you would need to achieve, and that would get at the council's goal of producing a substantial number of affordable units, in this case, even more. Um, there are locational restrictions that we have built in to our proposal in terms of where that offsite project could go. It includes um, within the downtown plan, 
itself within a half mile of the expansion area or within the coastal zone, right? The, the um, downtown plan expansion area is all within the coastal zone and we're cognizant of having um, affordable housing mixed within the coastal zone as well. So that's the second option offsite. And then <clears throat> the third option here is um, in lieu fees. And the in lieu fees would go towards um, our affordable housing trust fund. And um, our affordable housing trust fund um, could be getting you know, upwards of $10 million from a single project. Um, you know, that's obviously going to uh, vary depending on um, uh, the size of that project. But um, we have been talking with um, one development team and based on the numbers that they have been contemplating, if they were to choose that in lieu fee option, that would be about a $10 million contribution. Um, with that, I think I'll, I'll turn it over to Sarah Noisy here, our senior planner, and she can talk about how some of that um, in lieu fee can be used as part of a- Mr. Noisy, good afternoon, welcome. Hi, good afternoon. Apologies for my tardiness. Y'all are running snappy meetings lately, so um, I thought 45 minutes ahead of time would be plenty, and I was wrong, so my sincerest apologies. Um, thanks, Lee, for covering the beginning part of this um, presentation. I do just want to address this piece about um, displacement. So we've heard from um, both the community and from council members, planning commissioners, concerns about displacement. Um, as we discussed in the staff report, the state law um, and our local codes already provide um, pretty robust accommodations for people who are directly displaced. That is, they live on a parcel that is going to be redeveloped. State law provides 42 months of relocation support for low-income tenants that are in that situation. Our local ordinance provides two months of relocation support for anyone in that moder moderate income category. And then again, state law requires a minimum of one month for any um, involuntary move by a tenant. So one of the things that's not covered is sort of this indirect displacement. So um, this is sort of one of the concerns people have around gentrification. Um, are there any ways that we can strengthen and create a, a local preference to support households that might be at risk of facing this indirect displacement simply because rents are rising, market conditions are changing for them? So typically in publicly funded projects, so projects that are 100% below market rate housing, um, a lot of those funding sources prohibit including local preferences, so preferences for local residents. The, those units have to be publicly available housing and open to really any American resident or citizen. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of exceptions to that, and SB 649, which was passed, I believe, two years ago, created a new protected category of households at risk of displacement, defined those households, and um, created the opportunity for local jurisdictions to create a program to fund 100% below market rate projects that reserve a portion of those units for households at risk of displacement that meet that definition. So um, there are some challenges with a program like this. It requires a really substantial amount of funding because you have to be able to fund a whole project um, relying heavily on those city sources. And if we had such a source of funds, it could be um, a really great tool for ensuring that there is a set-aside specifically allocated to city residents who are at risk of displacement from economic forces. So that, this is one of the reasons we wanted to include that in-lieu fee option to create and support that um, funding as a resource um, to be, in order to be able to create that tenant preference. So with that, we'll get to our staff recommendation, which is a um, request for a motion to direct staff to include this downtown density bonus as discussed here and in the report in the amendments when we bring them forward for your final review as part of the downtown specific plan. Um, consider options for a funding source could be used to create a local affordable housing tenant preference for households at risk of displacement. That will take a little bit of extra work. Um, there's some statistical analysis that has to be conducted. So we're looking for direction on that. Um, and then finally acknowledge that the council's direction as part of this action is exempt from CEQA under CEQA guidelines um, 15306 information gathering. And we are available for any questions. Thank you. Let's start with questions or comments from members. Questions, comments, Ms. Brown? Thank you. 
Uh, um, thank you for the substantial work that you've all done uh, to, to try to uh, respond to the direction given by council and, and appreciate the policy goals. I am wondering about the, on the in-lieu option, I definitely understand the logic and appreciate the interest in addressing local preference. Um, wondering how, if you could talk a little bit more about how you came to the $60 per square foot um, formula. Sure, yeah, happy to. So um, we worked with uh, Kaiser Marston to analyze um, kind of what the, what the difference in cost would be between the city downtown density bonus and the state density bonus. So, so always in our minds is thinking about incentivizing choosing the city program over using the state density bonus. So um, we looked at sort of the difference in rent that could be generated on a project if you hold constant the number of base units, the number of bonus units, and then we start adjusting those levels of affordability and percentages and we got to a, a, a gap between those two of about $58 a square foot. It was like 58 and change. So um, wanting to make that in lieu fee, I mean, we do want to make it an, a real option and we don't want it to be the most appealing option. We'd like people to, you know, choose to build on site. So we've made, we've kind of scaled these incentives in that way. So on site, you're, it financially based on our analysis is going to be the biggest incentive then next would come off-site, and then finally would come that in-lieu fee. So we just took that gap and rounded up. That's how we got there. Ms. Brown, other members on this item. Members of the public who are with us today wish to comment on this item. This would be your opportunity to do so. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Brian Shields. I'm from the newly minted local 646 for the Carpenters Union. Uh, 505 that was domiciled in uh, in Aptos is no longer. And now we are 646. It's Monterey and Santa Cruz County combined. Um, I've come and spoke before this body several times uh, and uh, a few times considering uh, the downtown expansions plan specifically. Uh, I think that it's extremely important uh, that some level of labor standard be applied to it. Uh, you know, whether it's healthcare, if it's apprenticeship, if it's something. But what it is, is it's an investment in the people who are going to be building it, right? Uh, I was just looking through some of the documentation that we have. You have individuals traveling from Stockton to build this that are being paid a substandard wage and, and probably, likely, sleeping on the, uh, in their cars around town here, right, to save money. Um, I remember when I walked uh, one of the projects downtown here um, a few years ago when it was still a wood frame, I ended up speaking with a framer who... Uh, him and his friends stayed in their car and they commuted in from out of town. Um, and that's, that's how these projects, that's how this beautiful downtown expansion plan will be, uh, will be built. It'll be built on the backs of people who are sleeping in their cars four nights a week and trying to commute home to, um, to uh, uh, have some form of family or livelihood. Um, so I think that a level of, uh, of, labor standard would be extremely appropriate to apply here. Um, and it would provide for opportunity for folks that live here in Santa Cruz. And if it does uh, end up bringing in people from Stockton again, at least that individual would have a level of dignity building it. Um, yeah, so I, I would love to have that conversation with each and every one of you to follow this up. And, uh, and I know that we're sort of late, but um, I I'd like to for that application to be made. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do we have anyone online, Ms. Bush, with their hand raised? On Nobody with their hand raised. Good afternoon. Welcome. Hi. Hi, my name's Kim. I'm just kind of entering politics today. <laughs> so I'm just curious. Um, I can't really decipher if you're going to be doing um, a 12-story building or an 8-story building based on the proposition that was put up there. Can you answer that for me? I think the answer to that question is, uh, from a policy perspective, here's what we're managing towards. Uh, we're managing towards 1,600 units downtown, no building taller than 12 stories, 
twenty percent of all of those units after density bonuses are in one of the affordable categories as defined by the state and federal government. As to whether people go eight stories or twelve stories, that's a decision private sector developers are going to make. What is being recommended to us is trying to create those incentives to go with the greatest density downtown, getting the greatest number of affordable units, and based on issues such as construction materials, uh, the concept is it may incent folks to go with the smaller buildings with greater floor area ratio. I think that may be sort of the nub of this issue today. Okay, I didn't follow the second part very well, but um, so it sounds like a 12-story building. Say it again, excuse me. I, di I just didn't follow the second part of that, but it sounds like you're, you're trying to increase housing in Santa Cruz. Yes. And the way I understand it is, you know, the University of California continues to bring more and more students in, and they can't keep up with the housing need. So the Santa Cruz City is building housing to accommodate the students. Um, and that's all good, because hopefully we can figure out how to accommodate the needs of our low-income people, you know, as the secondary priority, which is unfortunately the secondary priority. But my comment is I really hope that the council can start paying attention to cultural um, perspectives on this, per uh, the fact that UCSC has its own approach to what's happening in our society. Um, the fact that the Latino population has its own approach to what's happening in the society. And the Housing Matters people have an approach that, and they're really actually having a lot of problems, I think, that need to be really, they have their own set of problems that really need to be worked on. Um, and I think that if we, instead of just throw it all in one basket, I, I have to say, instinctually, I liked the displaced housing, you know, we're low income. I mean, I, I was a little bit scared that it would be like substandard, but like putting, you know, the low income community together in a, in a separate area seems like a better, healthier culture to me. And avoiding, you know, like imposing on, you know, Latino population in the coastal areas, like kind of, I know it sounds like segregation, but. I think that culturally it, will, it would be useful to pay attention to those issues. And I'd like to see transitional rehab at Housing Matters. I want it to be transitional. And then those people can get integrated into the community that are clean and sober. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else who wishes to comment on this item? Matters back before the body. Call here the body. Council Member Newsom. I'll make a motion to uh, accept the staff recommendation. There's a motion. There's a second by Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Debate or discussion? You may open on your motion, sir. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just want to uh, uh, just very briefly just thank staff for bringing this forward and this uh, downtown density uh, bonus plan forward for the downtown density plan. I'm uh, happy to see uh, this plan and it's moving towards us regaining local control in terms of uh, uh, controlling trying to regain some local control, provide more affordable housing, and I'm really happy to see uh, looking into uh, how we can implement SB 649 and identify funding sources for an anti-tenant uh, displacement preference. Uh, so just want to thank staff for bringing this forward and happy to support it. Councilmember Watkins is recognized. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to thank the staff also. I was curious as we were going through the presentation, how many plans have this type of design? It seems innovative to me in terms of this local density option as an incentive over the state density option. And I'm wondering if you could speak to how it's compared with other jurisdictions. Uh, you're asking if other places have their own local density bonus yeah, programs? As a priority or sort of as an incentive. I'm, so there are lots of places that have a local density bonus. I, I'm not aware of any at this point that are like specifically targeting competition with the state density bonus. I mean, I, if we weren't in the middle of doing a big plan like this, I don't know that we would have been driven sure. to create a policy if you all would have been driven to give us that direction, right? So um, I'm not currently aware of anyone else that's like specifically pursuing this. 
Yeah, which is great. I think it's really innovative, and thank you for your work for coming up with a solution that I feel like does help our council have some control at the local level to design what we're hoping to see you know, in our downtown. So yeah, just yeah, thank you, and I'm supportive of the motion. Councilmember Colin Tar Johnson. Yeah, uh, Councilmember Watkins sort of took the words out of my mouth. Um, we gave a, a very challenging policy direction, and um, there was a lot of out-of-the-box thinking. So just want to acknowledge and appreciate that. Councilmember Brown. I, too, want to appreciate the staff for coming up with uh, or attempting to come up with uh, an approach that we can use here locally um, as it, given the state law and the density bonus rules which are you know quite attractive to developers uh, I think that and I've said this before local control maintaining as much as we possibly can is critical um, I, I, I I intend to support the uh, motion but I do want to say I have some concerns I always have concerns about in lieu um, you know we know that we didn't get any low-income units built in our community for a very long time because developers opt for in lieu fees as an alternative and uh, so I'm given the all the kind of moving parts here and the interest in making this about supporting uh, potentially displaced residents I am will I'm gonna give it I'm gonna say yes let's try this um, I, I do have some concerns about also about the second option so just thinking about what um, where these uh, off-site units that would be uh, approved and kind of constructed almost concurrently I won't go into the details of that but I appreciate how you laid that out um, the a lot of the area that might be available for that for new construction would be actually redevelopment of ex there's existing housing stock there much of which is um, what I think folks here like to call naturally occurring affordable housing um, not deed restricted but uh, so there's going to be in order to redevelop there there would be displacement as well and so I guess I'm I'm just trying to figure out um, or would would that second option potentially be creating an additional displacement problem um, so maybe um, if you have any thoughts on that I'd like another question but because um, I, I just want to make sure that I'm like yeah. that the community is clear that you know we're all clear about what that means um, yeah, of course. That's uh, that's actually a really important point. I'm glad you brought that up. So um, the state law around housing has changed a lot in the last five years. You all are deeply aware of that. One of the ways that in which it has changed is to um, strengthen protections for households that are facing direct displacement, which is the condition that you're describing. So when there is a lower income household, as defined in state law, um, living on a site that is proposed to be redeveloped with any kind of housing, the following benefits are afforded to that tenant. They are entitled to a minimum of 42 months of relocation expenses, so three and a half years of paying the difference between their current rent and whatever rent they need to pay to be relocated. They are, have the right to stay in their unit until six months prior to the start of construction. They have the right to return to a deed-restricted affordable unit. So 100% um, of the units that are occupied by low-income households have to be replaced with deed-restricted affordable units, affordable to that income category. So um, yes, there is a period of displacement, and I don't want to minimize that. That can be very disruptive for communities. If construction takes two years, um, kids may be enrolled in different schools. Not everyone may come back, right? Like, there is a concern there. and in terms of the housing stock that you're creating over time, um, you're gonna get more units that are permanently affordable out of this condition than we have today. So um, that's, that's the answer to your question. So it's not a perfect solution, nothing is, and um, that is a piece that has been really well considered at this point in the state law, and we, of course, would comply with that. And I did just wanna add one more thing on that too. Uh, say there is a developer using this off-site option and 
they're looking to put that project on somewhere that says, say it's 10 units that currently exist. Uh, and those 10 units are all uh, have lower income households. Uh, we've also written into our policy that the state, the developer has to replace those 10 units per state requirements, but that those 10 units of replacement can't count towards the offsite amount. So they, they can't, they have to stack on top of each other. They can't be housing in each other. So that's even a, a, a better approach to, you know, further those units. Thank you for that, because that was the piece that I really wanted to get clarified as well. So thank you. Yep, Appreciate and it. That's something we can do with the state density bonus, and we can do with this option. Thank you. Further debate or discussion? Seeing, hearing none. Clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Council Member Bruner is disqualified. Colin Terry Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder is absent. And Mayor Cooley? Aye. Motion passes and it's awarded. We're on item 17. This is brought to us by Human Resources. This amends the City of Santa Cruz personnel complement and classification and compensation plans for the economic development, housing, finance, fire, human resources, information, technology, parks and recreation, planning and community development, police, public works, and water departments. Ms. De Leon, good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor. Thank you. We'll just take a moment to share the screen. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. So today, um, item 17, I have two distinct areas of focus in the staff report. Um, one of them and the larger fiscal impact has to do with pay increases, um, compensation increases to multiple service areas of the city. Um, this is the larger focus of the report of the fiscal impact. We will spend most of our time here. The second part of this report has to do with personnel complement changes um, to our general classification and comp plans, whether that's cleanup of classifications that are no longer used and some new ones. Some have fiscal impacts, others don't. So we'll go through that before the end. In regards to item one, the request before you today has to do with compensation increases with the following focus. What we looked at was service areas that have to do with public safety, that also have recruitment and retention issues, and that also because of those recruitment and retention issues based on service, certain projects coming up that could have a very negative impact if we don't have the staff to do the work. All of the proposal before you is based on our 2021 market study. I did not just pull numbers from the air. It is grounded and connected to benchmarking and mapping in our 2021 compensation study. Um, it's also important to recognize that the fiscal impacts here over impact both our general fund and our enterprise funds as well. So in regards to the areas of focus, we're looking at our police uh, department, specifically our police officers, as well as police sergeants. Um, their vacancy rates and turnover rates have been quite high as identified in our staff report, sometimes consistently 20% just by vac vacancy. And over five years, we've recruited about 58 different times. Um, and that cost for recruitment from a time, energy, a standpoint from multiple areas is a lot, significant. Um, and so when we're thinking about our police department, the proposal for them um, is a 2.5% increase uh, for those police officers and sergeants to hope, hopefully address some of our high turnover and vacancies. For our building and safety division, information technology, and water and wastewater services, um, these areas either have a mix of high vacancy or turnover rates um, or, and or service demands and major projects that are coming up that are critical for us to sustain. For example, legacy system upgrades in our information technology department, capital improvement planning in both our water and wastewater, some totaling as high as $500 million in CIP, and very large um, upcoming development projects that impact our building and safety staff. Um, those specifically are our building inspectors and our plans examiners. Those complex projects really require someone looking at the appropriate architecture development and building throughout. Um, California building code is complex, so it's important to keep those people um, in place. 
So again, those are uh, the areas of focus and kind of the journey of which the proposal is in front of you today. Um, the total overall is about 1.8 million annually. 1.2 of that is enterprise funds. We did try to balance and minimize the impacts to the general fund itself, um, but recognizing the value add by you know, retaining and recruiting staff, I do believe and recommend that it is worth moving forward with. So that's the compensation increase aspect to attract and retain our staff. The second smaller piece is our classification and comp plan changes. There's a little bit with a fiscal impact of totaling about $42,000 of impact to our general fund. We add a new principal planner to our transportation division of public works, and we also correct a mapping issue in our economic development department that we, I missed in a previous increase. And the items there without fiscal impact are basic deletions and additions of new classifications we're considering. Um, one of them has been the program analyst, which I wanted to call out because this is a specific attempt of career development between internal staff, bridging gaps between our administrative series to our analyst series, and even trying to inspire our local, maybe students just graduating college. This is a really great entry point into local government, and I wanted to put a plug in for that new classification. With that said, um, I do want to note, um, with the permission of Ms. Bush, that we did have a revised budget adjustment, um, but otherwise the motion is here before you for your consideration and I'm available if questions. Would you take just a moment on the revised item so that the public is clear on the revision? Sure. Thank you. Um, so we just had a simple uh, modification to the budget adjustment for the enterprise funds. It is not coming from the reserves. It is in fact coming from enterprise salary savings and a number of other specific accounts that their analysts helped with. Thank you, Ms. De Leon. Questions by members of Ms. De Leon on this item? Members of the public who would wish to comment on this item, this would be your opportunity to do so. Good afternoon, welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I am an SEIU member and steward at the City of Santa Cruz. I just wanna urge you to pass this motion uh, to bring our employees up to market rate. The 2021 classification study identified a lot of discrepancies in our positions in our area. Uh, this is the fifth uh, compensation increase. I wanna thank Sarah and Heidi for really championing this. The positions that this targets the most and affects the greatest are necessary for critical city operations in our water and wastewater divisions. Um, I just want to thank you for hearing this and strongly urge you to lift our employees up to continue to serve our residents the best we can. Thank you. Thank you for your good work. Thank you for being here today. Ms. Bush, do we have anyone online who wishes to comment? We'll take the person online. Good afternoon and welcome. Person online, this is your opportunity. Hello, this is uh, Ken Bear, City of Santa Cruz and SEIU 521. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So I, I'm calling in to, to concur with uh, my shop, Stuart, that I just heard from. And I, I strongly recommend that we that you adopt this uh, proposal uh, to bring uh, members up to uh, closer to parity with, with their surrounding areas in order to retain uh, quality health and attract new health. Uh, if there's anything uh, we can do in the future, I certainly hope uh, we can uh, work together towards that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Greg Bengtson, uh resident of Santa Cruz and a uh, uh, registered voter. Um, I... I totally back. Um, I mean, parity is number one. That that's how you mm -hmm. keep a quality pool of, of personnel, and even in the cops, um, there's people out there that have the things that say that they're equivalent to the KKK. No, no. I mean, number one, I think, and I told Escalante this, Chief Escalante. Um, you know, they might hassle us, but I think they do it in a very professional, kind professional patient way um and 
you know, truth needs to be told. Uh, nobody should come to Santa Cruz thinking that they're going to be disrespected like that. And that's, but free speech. Um, I totally back them. And take that as somebody who um, just had all of my belongings thrown away by the cops yesterday, but it's not their fault. They're, they're told to do one thing, and, um, and if they make mistakes, they're still professionals about it. And so professionals can make mistakes, and we will follow up when they do make mistakes. Um, but we'll do it in a kind, professional way, just the way they treat us and the way that you guys treat us, allow us to speak. And um, <clears throat> I think this is a great, a great city, a great city to be homeless in, um, uh, be a better city to be a resident. Well, I, I am a resident, but um, I really appreciate what is here, what's possible. Um, yeah, my, I had four tickets in 24 hours for loitering, which loitering is sitting around doing nothing with no apparent purpose. I mean, I just yesterday, right before I got my stuff taken, I was taking care of people that were overdosing in the parking lot. All my Narcan was taken and thrown away. All my medical equipment was thrown away. Luckily, because we live in this sort of a dope fiend environment, um, I still keep enough to save lives, even when the cops throw away our stuff and call me loitering. Loitering, hanging out with no apparent purpose, make sure that this city council and that staff, and I don't mean to like, <laughs> sorry, Matt. Um, I, I actually appreciate everybody here, and um, let's just not loiter when we are at the helm of the ship. There's a lot more we can do. We really need to uh, pay attention. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else online? Not with wish? their hand up. No. Anyone else wish to comment on the item? Matters back before the body. Pleasure of the body. Ms. Condor, excuse me, Ms. Brown. May I please? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'd uh, like to move the staff recommendation. There's a motion. I'll second. second. We have lots of seconds. This time, Ms. Bruner, you're going to get the second on that. Ms. Brown, on your motion. I just want to say that uh, I am thrilled to have the opportunity to make this motion. Thank you to my colleagues for um, allowing me to do so, and, and thank you for the support. I have been on this body for almost eight years now, and most of the time I have been the uh, person who's been quite negative about the recommendations that come before us with respect to our bargaining units because I believe that, I mean, not, not that others don't, but I really truly believe that uh, supporting our workforce is the most important thing that we do here. Uh, you all are the folks who make this city run. When I hear people say, "There's we can't afford it, it's like, we can't not afford it. We need to have people who are well compensated, um, who can afford to live here, who aren't sleeping in their cars themselves, uh, working a city job, a public sector job. So I am just so thrilled. I want to really appreciate uh, Ms. DeLeon for all of the work that you have done. Your commitment is uh, really beyond compare uh, in, in all of the uh, work that I've done here at the city and other public agencies and um, and thank the workers for uh, you know continuing to stand up and to say tell us what the right thing to do um, and hold us accountable so thank you and thanks to everyone for being supportive of this increase in parity thanks thank you Ms. Brown further on this item Ms. Brunner Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just briefly wanted to um, say that since 2022, I haven't sat as long as Councilmember Brown, but since I was mayor in 2022, this has been a commitment to invest in our employees. And this is an example of the new position that Sarah De Leon fills and the work that's being done. and that we address organizational needs and commit in investing in our employees. Um, this is part of city business. 
thank you to each department and all the staff every day for the hard work and we continue to um, make progress forward and really address um, you know the personnel complement so thank you so much for um, finding a way to continue moving forward in this thank you Ms. Brainer. further on the item clerk will call the roll council member is Newsom aye Brown aye Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder is currently absent, and Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Item 18 has been pulled from the agenda to no particular date in the future. Item 19. Item 19 is a second reading and final adoption of. Uh, ordinance number 2024-17, adding the municipal code and various other items uh, regarding uh, accessory dwelling units and, and other matters. We do have a staff report from Mr. Van Waugh and the planning department. We have more than a couple of pieces of paper in our agenda packet. Mr. Van Waugh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, Matt Van Waugh, principal planner advanced planning and we have online uh, joining us remotely uh, Clara Steiner who is the uh, senior planner and the project manager for this we'll have a brief presentation for you all we do want to mention that we uh, extend our uh, best wishes uh, to her because we understand she's a bit under the weather today so we want to thank her for joining from uh, not feeling well that's very kind of her thank you Clara take it away Uh, thank you so much, Mayor Keeley, for your best wishes. Um, good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. Um, today I'm presenting um, the second reading of proposed changes to the city's regulations for accessory dwelling units, or ADUs. Um, first reading, we've received a fair amount of correspondence on this item, mostly relating to the owner occupancy um, question, and we have a few quick slides on that. Um, next slide, please. Um, I can keep talking while they're working on the slide. Um, so uh, basically, at the first reading, uh, what was approved was that uh, we removed owner the owner occupancy requirements for any newly permitted ADU um, permitted in 2020 and beyond, um, but we are retaining owner occupancy requirements for ADUs constructed before 2020. Um, so we've heard from several people who believe that the city cannot continue to require that owner occupancy for ADUs constructed prior to 2020. Um, and we've also received conflicting feedback from the State Department of Housing and Community Development, or HCD. We've reached out to them again and are awaiting a more definitive response from HCD. Uh, but based on what we've heard from various sources so far, the authors who wrote that law said that their intent was to remove owner occupancy for all ADUs, including retroactively for the existing ADUs. Um, however, the law as written doesn't seem to reflect that intent. Next slide, please. Um, so here's the um, state law section 66315, um, and you can read that on the screen. But basically, the state law section refers specifically to proposed ADUs, and we cannot, um, and that we cannot impose an owner occupancy requirement on a proposed ADU. So based on the fact that it says proposed, that is a specific limitation in the force of this language and how it can be applied. Um, therefore, based on this interpretation, council's decision would be considered um, consistent with state law as written in that the amendments do not impose an owner occupancy requirement on proposed ADUs, but rather they retain an owner occupancy requirement that had been previously imposed on previously approved ADUs. Um, again, we are awaiting a formal response on this matter, and we can bring that back to council if needed. Uh, next slide. Um, and here's just next steps. Um, so today, the next step um, would be to approve the second reading if that's what council chooses to do. 
Um, and then in December, we would bring um, an additional ordinance um, back to city council. Um, and I can explain that in a moment. Um, so regardless of the decision that council makes on this item, it is important that the ordinance is improved today so that the ordinance is in place within the state mandate timeframe and our local ordinance continues to be in effect. Um, otherwise, if this approval is delayed um, to a later date, it will cause our local ordinance to lapse for a week or more. If council does wish to make any changes today from what they had um, decided at the first reading, then staff recommends those changes be brought back as a separate item at a later date. Uh, we are bringing a follow-up ordinance to council in December to address the new state laws um, that will come into effect January 1st. And so any changes made today can be made with that ordinance if needed. HCD is also doing a separate review um, of our ordinance uh, as required by the Coastal Commission. So any changes as a result of that review will also be brought in December with the follow-up ordinance. And that concludes my very brief presentation and staff is available for questions. Questions? Ready for questions? Members? Questions, comments? Members of the public, this will be your opportunity to comment on this item. Good afternoon. Welcome. Am I on? Okay, oh, please great. Do. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Kim Dean, and I live on the Lower West Side with my husband and two kids. My son is Cooper. He's here supporting me today. Uh, my husband and I purchased our home in 2018, and it came with a permitted ADU and has an owner occupancy deed restriction. In 2022, several years after California prohibited enforcement of owner occupancy deed restrictions on new ADU permits, I contacted the city to see how I could have my owner occupancy deed restriction removed essentially to be on equal footing as any neighbor who is building a new ADU. I was told that the only way I could have the restriction removed was to decommission my ADU by making it a non-living space. This process would require me to tear out my fully functional kitchen and bathroom in the ADU, patch everything up and have the city come out, confirm the decommissioning, then the restriction would be removed and I could apply for a whole new ADU permit, put the whole same kitchen and bathroom back in, so all that effort, time, and money to come back full circle just to be in line with what all new ADUs are being offered. This is the only remedy available, and it is a cost prohibitive and unjustly punitive. It is also unfair to require us to apply for exemptions, which inherently requires sharing personal and private information in order to justify renting out our homes, whereas our neighbors with new ADUs wouldn't require such permission. It's unfair. One of the reasons Councilwoman Watkins gave for opposing the lifting of these owner occupancy requirements is that prior city councils have historically rejected lifting the restriction. So why should this council do anything different? My rebuttal would be that there has been no other time in history where California has prohibited enforcement of owner occupancy requirements for permitted ADUs after 2020. So it's logical that this issue would come to the forefront again. The laws have changed, and we are asking to have our ADU deed restrictions be changed to reflect the current law. Removing owner occupancy rules for all pre-2020 ADUs would remedy one of the several inequalities imposed on us merely because we have permitted prior to 2022. 2020, excuse me. Thank you for your time and patience, and I look forward to hearing from you regarding these issues. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Let me check something before you provide. Ms. Push, or do we have folks online? So what we're going to do is just alternate back and forth. Person online, welcome and good afternoon. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, um, I have a couple uh, items to bring up. In section 24.16.150, item 7, let me again repeat, 24.16.150, item 7, which is the use standards. 
The language is unclear to me, and I was hoping that one of the county council members would ask the staff uh, if when an ADU is rented, both the accessory dwelling unit and primary dwelling unit be registered with the residential inspection and maintenance program. Uh, the reason I'm asking that is I, I didn't realize that if you rent an ADU, that your primary dwelling unit, the house where I'm living in, also has to be entered into the program when it's not rented. So if that can be brought up, um, it's uh, I'm a District 3 um, a member or a resident, and I do appreciate you guys uh, uh, considering these changes to meet the state. Now, the one thing, um, Josh Wright, who is Assembly Members uh, Phil Tang's legislative director, he wrote, and I believe you have now seen uh, copies of his statements, that the existing law, quote, prohibits local governments from imposing owner occupancy requirements. So if there was an ordinance on the books that required owner occupancy when AB 976 was signed, unquote, and then let me continuation with this quote, that that ordinance was already in violation of state law. So while I do appreciate hearing that there would be a, another ordinance being brought to the table uh, by December, and I understand that it sounds like there's a requirement to get something on the books approved today, uh, I'm just, again, uh, supportive of removing that owner occupancy requirement uh, because according to uh, Phil Tang's staff member, uh, that is uh, what's the kind of the gist behind this uh, proposal. Um, now, the other thing about the residents that have ADUs prior to 2020, now they, they took a, a risk, they developed the ADU, they've probably had their assessment values increased, they've contributed to the economy and to the city coffers, and now I think that we're treating them as alternate or substandard citizens because you're not a, you're not removing that owner occupancy requirement, and that's pretty unfair to me. And like you'll hear many times, uh, there's many others that agree with that assessment. And I also want to just point out if you do remove that and they do sell, then that property will be reassessed at a higher value, which again will bring in more revenue to the city and the county. So I just want to make sure that you understand that. Um, yes, maybe not today, but I sure hope in the future it's removed. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Kaylin Kelson, and I appreciate the time today. And you have a very soft voice. If you would raise that microphone. There, there we, we go. go. And all of your efforts and for hearing us out today. So I built an ADU back in 2015. Um, I'm subject to the deed restriction that has been had huge consequences for me in other areas of my life because I've not been able to rent out my units or both units and you know be elsewhere if, if I need to be. And I'm watching sitting here and you all are building tons of housing, which is great. And I am trying to offer that in some cases for you know offer housing to my community and also benefit from that. And I think that's fair. You have developers who are now benefiting hugely from that as well. So I just would ask that you all consider that and move to um, vote to remove the deed restriction on my property. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another person online, Ms. Bush. We'll take that next person online. Good afternoon. Welcome to the city council meeting. Good afternoon and thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Adam Evans. Um, I was probably one of the first tranches as well. Um, converted uh, an ADU back in uh, 2017. And I just want to make a couple of points here. Uh, government code 66315 was mentioned earlier. Uh, and it specifies that local agencies cannot use additional standards or impose any additional requirements. So this is in conflict, as was previously mentioned with AB. Uh, 967 that specifies that the bill would instead prohibit local agencies from imposing any owner occupied requirement on any accessory dwelling unit. Uh, this was signed into law on October 11th, 2023. So it's a bit concerning that the ordinance, the active ordinance is in conflict with existing state law. <clears throat> um, we find that it's a bit punitive 
for those who went through the early rigors of converting ADU units, there was, you know, the permit fee revenues to do such a thing were extremely cost prohibitive. And when we look at, you know, the ease of restrictions or requirements, rather, for covered parking, so on and so forth, that we were subject to higher costs, longer times, and unnecessary delays during the permitting process. And we don't understand why we're being held to such higher restrictions and we're opening the doors to other people, other developers, what have you, without the same restrictions. It doesn't make sense as a stakeholder in this community. So I appreciate your time and I would urge you guys to vote to remove the owner occupancy restriction. It's not in line with the legislative intent of AB 967. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, good afternoon, city council members. I'm an owner of an ADU built pre-2020, mm -hmm. and I'm here today because the deed restrictions for the original ADUs has not been removed in accordance with ADUs built after 2020, despite the fact that this restriction is considered by current state law illegal and uh, not allowed. And I've, been, I've read that it's unenforceable as well. Um, and to, on a side note, seems like people are getting hung up over the word proposed, but uh, also not written in there is the word excluded um, towards the older units. So uh, there's one, there's many ways of reading this language. Um, and the city's planning department proposed rescinding this restriction, but the council voted against it. Um, can any of you please clarify how ADU owners pre and post 2020 can be categorized separately? in this manner. Um, I won't go through all the legion of regions why um, this is unfair. It's also counterproductive to the assertion repeatedly claimed by the city council to want to use ADUs which are built and financed by homeowners to increase the housing stock. With the OA deed restriction in place, the unintended consequences are that both the primary residence and the ADU can be taken off the market and left empty in order to comply if the owner is not residing on site, which seems insane. There are multiple reasons for the owner not to be on site. Uh, health, family needs elsewhere, travel and work. Should an owner be required, for example, to evict an ADU renter if they must be away from home? When there is a need to rent both units, why would deed restriction remain in force to reduce the potential habitation to zero? The loss of economic opportunity with regards to renting and limited property value in comparison to other post-2020 properties is a, in my opinion, less than satisfying way to be thanked by the city for the owner's expense of building an accessory dwelling unit. It's not a well thought out law, in my opinion, and it never was. Removal of the deed restriction seems an obvious and simple way to fix all of the above. Please officially remove the owner occupancy deed restriction for the ADUs built prior to 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Someone else online, Ms. Bush? No one else. Yes. Good afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Now there is. Okay, we'll take the person online, then we'll be right with you. Person online, good afternoon and welcome. Hello. Yep. Hi. Um, good afternoon. My name is Carolyn. Good afternoon. My name is Carolyn Coleman, and I've lived in the Seabright neighborhood since 1981 when my husband and I were fortunate enough to be able to buy a small home at a time when a school counselor and nonprofit worker could do that. Fast forward to April 2019 when we completed a 750 square foot ADU for our son and his family to live in, since as community social workers, there was no way they could afford to be homeowners in the town he grew up in. I was shocked to learn that the council did not remove the owner occupancy requirement for ADUs built prior to 2020, which seems like a clear cut fix for a two tiered arbitrary system. Why should our property completed a few months prior to 2020 and those who built in the preceding years continue to have a deed restriction when our neighbors who have built since then don't have the same limitations? It was striking to learn that there have been 375 ADUs permitted since 2020 
and that number will soon outpace the 550 ADUs built in the prior 34-year period. Now those who took the initiative to create these units prior to 2020 are being unfairly held to a different standard. Whatever the reasons or unintended consequences that some council members think these deed restrictions must be retained are certainly being experienced in the change since 2020. We're almost five years down the road on this. Is there data on how many of these post-2020 properties are owner-occupied? Analysis of any negative neighborhood or economic impacts? The state clearly saw the benefit in acting AB 976 a year ago, which extends the prohibition against owner occupancy requirements indefinitely. Perhaps the selling of ADUs separately requires further study and that was coupled in the ordinance, but why wait the proposed two years to fix the inequity in the ADU deed restriction? Take action today to fairly treat all city ADU property owners equitably. Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Welcome. Um, Kathleen Prude, I live on the west side and had originally built my ADU for my mom to live in. Um, I believe that Santa Cruz sees itself as a city that is fair and equitable, and the city should be in alignment with Bill AB 976. I'm here today to ask that the vote, you vote to remove the owner occupancy requirement deed restriction from ADUs that were built prior to 2020. When I built my ADU in 2013, there was building requirements that have now been removed. A couple of examples are installing the sprinkler system, which required me to also update my water line and meter, and paving my 50 feet of alley access to the back of my house. I am, I am sure there are more requirements that have been removed from the permit process since 2013. Having the owner occupancy deed restriction limits what I can do with my property in regarding to selling or renting. <clears throat> In the future, if I need to move to assisted living, being able to rent out both homes would make this possible without having to sell my property and not displacing a tenant who would be living in the ADU or the main house, leaving one home vacant and not able to rent if I'm off property. My current tenant stated to me that she hopes to stay until she is moved to assisted living herself. I would hate to have to evict her or a future tenant if I need to sell my property. Removing the restriction would allow more available rental housing in Santa Cruz. Please be fair and equitable to all former and future homeowners with ADUs to have all the same requirements and not the same restrictions. Uh, you need to vote to remove the owner occupancy requirement. Thank you. Thank you. Another person online, Ms. Bush. Good afternoon, Ms. Plahamis. Good afternoon. Welcome to the council meeting. Hi, Carol Plahame is here. And again, I want to thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm a member of about a 65 person group of ADU owners that have been kind of meeting off and on since the early days. Um, so one point I'd like to make, there are three reasons I want to ask you to please remove the owner occupancy requirement. One is legal, one is logistical, one is ethical. So a number of our members have talked to Assemblyperson Ting's office. Some people have talked to the State Housing and Community Development Office. Some people have talked to uh, the Housing Defense Fund folks. And the consensus of all those discussions is that the state did intend to remove all the uh, ADU owner occupancy requirements in forward and arrears. And because of uh, the way it was written, the legislative I forget what they call it, but the synthesis says all, and the actual law says proposed. So I believe they're working on that, and that it will only be a matter of time before they come up with a correct language thing. But in the meantime, um, we believe that that's the intent. So here's the practical. Santa Cruz, I remember when this happened, was one of the first cities in the state to have an ADU ordinance. We were proud of it. We published a you know, little document that had all the kind of templates for how to go about it. There, was, It was a big hairdo. It was, it was in the media. We were cutting edge, and it was awesome. And the reason we did that is we wanted to increase the housing stock at no cost to the city. There was no money for the city to build housing. We wanted to incentivize owners to build the housing to help us with rentals and additional housing stock. So um, like Kathy said, I built my unit in 2004 to house my parents. I know I've bored you with the story too many times, but... I, it was a big deal. I had to do fire sprinklers, covered parking, setbacks. I had to replace the water meter in the street. 
I had to do, uh, there were just so many requirements, none of which are required today for an ADU. Um, let's see. Sorry. Oh, an owner occupancy requirement is actually counterproductive to the original goal of increasing the rental housing stock because people who can't comply with the owner occupancy requirement are legally not allowed to rent. So I find it really ironic to to sit and listen to the discussion of the downtown expansion plan around, you know, people who are going to be displaced, which I am all aboard on, and at the same time not realize that actually by maintaining this owner occupancy requirement, you're really you're really displacing potential tenants. So people like me, you know, I'm getting old, I'm 72, I built my ADU 20 years ago, so it, ha it housed my parents, it's housed my kids, I'm now in the stage of my life where I'm taking care of my grandkids, but soon I'm going to be looking at assisted living too. And, you know, I, well, anyway, please remove it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Paul Hammes. Good afternoon, sir, and welcome. My name is Thomas Hamilton. I'm ex extremely deaf. I'm disabled vet. I built my ADU in 2011 when they first started it. I have the house on the Lind Vista project, which is up on Upper Alta Vista. My house was the first one there. We went through everything. They came out and had said, oh, you're eight inches too close to your house. You're going to have to re-evaluate. So we did all of our re-evaluation, did a new survey, what started out as, they said, that we were over $10,000 in fees. They said, oh, well, you can go low income. So I said, okay, we'll go low income. But by the time they required to put the, so the sidewalk in on a cul-de-sac that had none and moved my property and everything else and resurveyed, I ended up well over $130,000 when I had a, started with 70000 this is, I'm sorry, excuse me, this is BS. If you're going to give it to one, give it to everybody. It's only fair. Because I'm 78, I've been lived in my family's house for, since I came back to the States. My daughters, both are outside the company, will not live here. And I think this is unfair. If I have to sell my property when I go to uh, support or so forth, this is unfair. So thank you very much. Thank you for your service. Yeah. Good afternoon. Welcome. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Cindy Ferenzi. I want to thank you all for your service to our community. It's a big effort, and we complain sometimes about some of the issues, but overall I'm so appreciative of everything that you do. And thank you to the planning department for bringing forward the inequity about the ADU categories. I know that took a lot of work, and I appreciate that you cared. Um, uh, with respect to the four council members who supported the deed restriction, keeping it on our property, I understand your concern about increased housing costs. It's a big problem. But I don't think the answer is to disadvantage a subset of ADU properties especially when that disadvantage will just grow over time as more and more of them are permitted. Um, I would appreciate uh, understanding why you feel there, it, it's not a problem to have this inequity, uh, to address that directly rather than just the increase in housing costs. How do you, do you feel that it's uh, fair to have these two different groups for ADU uh, owners? Um, do you feel that that's a logical division that it's not arbitrary, that starting January 1st, 2020, there should be a difference between our, our regulations. It seems to me that uh, equity and uh, logic are so important in our housing regulations and consistency. Um, I'd also uh, appreciate knowing what your thoughts are about ADU properties in general. Do you support them? Do you think it's a mistake to go in that direction, that it's not helping with our housing stock? That would help, I think, maybe inform us about maybe your perspectives and why you might support keeping a restriction on just a subset of ADU properties. Um, I hope also that you had a chance to read the letter from the gentleman whose wife has Alzheimer's. It's very moving and I think also an important reminder that uh, what you do has a real impact on people's lives and sometimes those lives have pretty heavy burdens and uh, 
you can help them, or you can you can actually um, uh, make those burdens a bit heavier. Uh, I too have been in contact with Phil Ting's office when he was in office. Uh, I talked to Linda Rios, and she's an assistant who now works for uh, I believe uh, Assemblyman Carrillo. She has told me throughout that that uh, it was unenforceable to have separate regulations for pre-2020 ADU. So I was very surprised that uh, attorneys said uh, that it would be enforceable. But, you know, that's, I guess that's up in the air. Um, I think it's unfortunate that if we'd not had permits to begin with, we wouldn't have a restriction. I'm asking you to please consider equity in this. It's so important in our housing laws and uh, and to do away with any kind of arbitrary distinction between our properties. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sue. Sue, why don't you pull, Sue, pull that oh, microphone down okay. so we can hear you. There we go. Thank you, okay. Sue. Um, thank you for the opportunity. I really, uh, I'm going to speak for myself. Mm -hmm. I'm 76 years old. I have a heart condition. My property is, uh, I put it on the trust because I have a heart condition. I don't know when <laughs> I'm going to have the time bomb. So I may have to move to, my son is in New York, or my daughter is in London. How is that going to be owner occupy my property? I need, you guys need to look into the legal ramification part of it. People own own the property under a trust. How do you handle that? I may be in a nursing home not far from here, mm -hmm. but I cannot be owner occupied. Do you understand? Do you all understand that? Mm -hmm. I hope you have parents close to my age that you have thought about that. That another another thing I want to point out is you cannot be just Excluding a small portion of people, my I did my ADU 2015. There were so many uh, requirements, thirty-five thousand dollars for just trenching the dedicated line for the sprinkler system. Nine months later, they eliminated that, and uh, and so on and so on. It feel like right hand does not know what left hand's doing. You agree, okay? For, for senior citizen, oh, I can tell there's a bunch of us uh, in this group that we're going to be excluded. I think that's inequitable, and that's, you need to serious thinking about that. Not far from now, you're going to be at my age, okay? That is not right. That is not right. And I need you to look into the legal part. I own the house. My house is under a choice, okay? What do you do? What did all these people, when they get sick and they cannot be in their home, own or occupy? Bullshit. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to comment on this item? Anyone else online? We have another person online. Good afternoon and welcome. online. Good afternoon. Hello, Mayor. Hello, hello, Mayor and Council. Thanks for taking my call. This is Eric Crawford. I hope you can um, split the two issues of owner occupancy and, and the condo conversion. On the condo conversion, I really think it'd be great if you looked at the issue of the multi-res condo conversion set. As I mentioned last time, there's an effective ban on that, and that seems like a much more logical place to start. <clears throat> on the owner occupancy issue, as everyone has mentioned, it's just not fair. And I think that the uh, city's legal position is tenable. I mean, the uh, code does say proposed, but you know what? That's gonna change. That was a drafting error. That's really clear. And, and um, I predict one of three things will happen and it will happen very soon. <laughs> Either the legislature will fix that drafting error, HCD will come down with a regulation or um, you'll get sued. One way or another, if you maintain this owner occupancy um, restriction, you're gonna look bad because it's gonna be overturned one way or another. And do you really wanna be the city council that 
promulgate this just patently unfair law. What, whatever consequences it has, which I think are greatly overblown, um, because as staff mentioned, pretty soon the number of post-2020 ADUs is going to surpass and overwhelm the number of pre-2020 ADUs. So whatever effect it would have would be negligible in a larger context anyway. But I think just do the right thing and, and don't leave this as one of your legacies. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Anyone else, Ms. Bush? Anyone else with us? Matters back before the body. Ms. Contar Johnson is recognized. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make a motion to proceed with staff recommendation um, to adopt ordinance number 202417. Um, I won't read all of it. It's up on the board. Adopt ordinance number 202418. Adopt a resolution other authorizing the city manager to submit a proposed um, um, amendment with the ordinance. So on, it's up on top. And then um, direct staff to include as part of ADU ordinance changes plan for December 10th, 2024 removal of owner occupancy requirements for ADUs constructed prior to 2020. Um, direct staff to include as part of the ADU ordinance changes plan for December 10th, 2024 um, option for ADUs to be sold as condominiums. Motion, is there a second? Second. My goodness. <laughs> My goodness, uh, Ms. Bruner, we're going to acknowledge you on that second. <laughs> Ms. Contar Johnson. Great. Thank you. Motion. Thank you. Um, I, I, it, there's not much more to say after hearing the speakers. I think they were very articulate and um, very aligned with the comments I made at the last meeting. Restrict making putting this restriction on our community members who were innovative, forward thinking, helping us with our policy directions around um, our housing goals and a ADUs as infill housing. Um, it's unfair to put these additional restrictions. And they said it, I think, better than I did. Um, because of the timing of our emer emergency ordinance sunsetting and the new state laws and the gap that it would cause and the, and the challenges that we'd face, um, I am proposing as part of my motion to move forward with the second reading of the current ordinance before us and then have this other ordinance come to us in December. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. I certainly. Ms. Watkins is recognized. I know there are others who wish to be recognized. We'll work our way through this. Ms. Watkins on the motion. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I want to also thank the, the folks that reached out to us and came and spoke today as well about their circumstances. I completely understand where you're coming from. I um, have really struggled with the state law coming in and really have not wanted to do anything above and beyond state law. And I agree, I think this is interpreted as a way that is probably going to be overturned because of the lack of clarity and for the owner op occupancy. So I'm comfortable with that change. Um, I think also just kind of having now served on council for eight years and been part of many conversations around housing, one of the things that we talked about with the ADUs and with the owner occupancy was just maintaining community, maintaining neighborhood and maintaining residency in that way. And that's changed with state law. It's been lifted, the development of more ADUs, the incentive of more ADUs is, is beyond our control. And there is an equity component and our neighborhoods are changing. And that's just the reality of it. I think we can do what we can to try to ensure that we still have some local control um, to the best of our ability. And I think we saw a little innovation earlier today in the item that we have for our downtown expansion. I really appreciate that. Um, and that's also where we want to see the most infill. That's definitely something I heard overwhelming from our community as well, is how do we build and how do we build in a place downtown where, where it makes sense for walkable communities and such like that. Um, so I'm comfortable with the change. I would actually ask that we could split the motion to remove the fifth. I'm not comfortable with moving forward with the condominium component. Any, um, item, any item that can be divided shall be divided upon a request of a member. It does not take a second. So the question will be divided. Great. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Brunner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to briefly state that um, I think this motion um, moves us forward at, um, in an equitable way to continue moving forward with our housing stock. As I said last time, this is really an equity thing. And our, as, when we refer to the ADU ownership prior to 2020, um, the fact that um, this direction uh, complies with our housing element alignment and with what 
is the equitable thing to do. It's the policy we need to move forward on. Uh, and as we align with our state laws, in December at that meeting, I really hope that this council moves forward um, with uh, removing that owner oc occupancy prior to 2020. As for the condo conversions, um, you know, AB 1033 allows ADUs to be mapped as condos for sale, and I think that helps provide housing diversity that we need. And so um, that, too, in this motion will be brought back in the December meeting as we align with even more state changes. But I think this, this right now helps us not have a gap in that emergency ordinance. And so... Um, I'm happy to support this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Newsom, on the motion. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. I just want to thank uh, my colleagues, Councilmember Collentari Johnson, for bringing this uh, motion forward, and Councilmember Bruner. Uh, I, think, uh, I think our decision is something we need to go back and look at. Um, as was stated, there's a lack of clarity around state law, especially around owner occupancy requirement, and it appears that what they wrote is different than what their intent is, which makes it hard to make a decision in the moment as far as uh, uh, when you're making decisions in the moment, but I think it's good to uh, uh, revisit that decision. I think it's also good to revisit and think over again the, the condos with the uh, sell of condos or sell of ADUs as condos as well and possibly um, possibly look at maybe options of how that could maybe be implemented, but then have staff come back and report back to us on what's taking place with those ADUs, how many properties are being sold, and uh, you know, and then Council could also consider rescinding uh, that idea, possibly as well, if we um, uh, if the data you know, speaks otherwise. So, thank you. Councilmember Brown is recognized on the motion. Thank you. I won't repeat uh, what my colleagues have already said, but I am in agreement. Uh, particularly, I want to highlight Councilmember Watkins' points here. Um, and, and, and kind of respond, Ms. Ferenzi, to your questions because, uh, you know, they, it sounds ridiculous to think, you know, it's, it is an arbitrary, yes, it, this is an arbitrary, you know, 2020 is an arbitrary date. Um, and, and it's arbitrary because the state of California, the legislature, imposed that uh, uh, rule with new state law. Uh, we didn't select it. There's no logic to it whatsoever. Uh, it's part of the onslaught of state legislation that has pushed local jurisdictions to uh, change. Well, really override uh, our own uh, our own codes. And so, you know, it, what I and the grandest irony in, uh, in particularly with respect to the owner occupancy piece of this is that with all of the real estate. Uh, money and the work that's going on in the state legislature by co very qualified people and their staff with all of that expertise that uh, we see the results of a drafting error. I mean, I just have to say that. <laughs> um, so I, um, I do have concerns. I continue to have concerns uh, about a lot of the state laws. Uh, the, the owner occupancy was intended to try to maintain community and to not uh, really incentivize absentee landlordism from speculative investors, right? That doesn't mean that there aren't folks who are being um, unfairly or, you know, unintendedly un, uh, 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 affected by this. So uh, I do, and, and the fact that this is just the way we're going to be moving forward based on state law, I do feel comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with uh, the you know pursuing a, a reach I, I'm going to call this a reach code even though that's not the context in which uh, we generally talk about reach codes to allow for uh, subdividing lots and and selling ADUs I think that that is much more of a stimulant to that speculative investment and it's going to make it a lot harder for people who do want to buy a home and live in it to actually do so because they're going to be competing with corporate interests as they already are now so much so in our community. So I do not feel comfortable with that. I appreciate the request to divide the motion and I'll leave it there. Thanks. For the debate or discussion. So I have asked this question. So what's going on up here right now is the vice mayor was not present for the debate and discussion 
or most of it, so I've asked the city attorney out of an abundance of caution here for her opinion on whether or not the vice mayor can vote on the measure. That's what's going on here. And I have checked the council member's handbook and I have not seen anything that would uh, prevent uh, Vice Mayor Golder from participating further. Very good, thank you very much for that. You certainly can. Thank you, I apologize when I was at court last week and I wasn't able to participate in, um, in a lot of this, but I have been following along and I appreciate the idea of dividing the motion. I understand the controversy around the subdividing of the lots with ADUs. Um, I, I, I actually can see how it would be helping with um, people getting starter homes if they built an ADU and split the lot and sold it. I, I could see that, but I understand your concerns as well. I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to say my opinion about the state law in regards to um, the ADUs being um, owner occupied, but it does seem ridiculous to have two sets of rules for our residents. And we've had, I've gotten a lot of communication from um, neighbors and friends that it's really kind of unfairly impacting them in ways that it seems unnecessary. So I'm happy with um, the motion that you guys brought forward, so thank you. For the debate or discussion, seeing hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Hewson? Aye. Brown? Let me, just let me be clear on what we're doing. We're going through these one at a time, one at a time. So this is on item number one, the adoption of ordinance 2024-17, adding, etc. So we are on that item. We're, we're going to do these one at a time. Here we go, first item. Council Member Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Bruner. Aye. Palantari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder. Aye. Mayor Kulitz. Aye. Passes and so ordered. Item number two, adoption of ordinance 2024-18, amending items in the center, the municipal code regarding accessory quality units and the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Bruner. Aye. Palantari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder. Aye. Mayor Keeley. Aye. Motion passes. Adopt resolution number NS30, excuse me, comma 402, authorizing the city manager to take certain actions. The clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Bruner. Aye. Palantari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder. Aye. Mayor Keeley. Aye. Next motion is to direct the staff to include as part of the ADU ordinance changes in December of 2024, removal of owner occupancy requirements for ADUs constructed prior to 2020. The clerk will call the roll. Council members in your seven. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkin. Aye. Bruner. Aye. Palantari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder. Aye. Mayor Keeley. Aye. The motion passes and so ordered. Item number five is direct staff to include as part of ADU ordinance changes planned for December 2024 an option for ADUs to be sold as condominiums. Clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? No. Watkins? No. Bruner? Aye. Palantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. The motion passes and so ordered. We are on item number... 20, and this is planning and community development item regarding review and adoption of revised citywide fee update and user fees and related actions. Good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My former graduate student. Nice to see you again. I am a former student of Mayor Keeley's. <laughs> Of course, with the students that were in that class, I feel like I'm the student. You were also good and smart. <laughs> good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. My name is Vivian Pearson, Principal Management Analyst of the Planning and Community Development Department. With the guidance and support of the Finance Director, Elizabeth Cabell, and Assistant Director Marisol Gomez, I am pleased to be able to present to you Phase 2 of the Comprehensive Fee Study. Phase one was uh, finished and completed in 2017 of April, and the fees were effective in July 1st of 2017. MGT Impact Solutions was selected through a competitive process as the uh, consultant to complete the study. 
I have Patrick Dyer here today and along with his team who has completed for the past year to work with the departments to revise their fees. Recent outreach efforts were conducted in August and September and the revised fees from phase two would take effect on January 1st, 2025. I would like to invite Patrick, Vice President of MGT, to present the analysis findings and methodology. Good afternoon and welcome, sir. Thank you, Mayor and members of council. Appreciate you giving us time to present our, our findings and our results. Um, as mentioned, uh, we looked at four departments, analyzed $4 million worth of costs, found that it was supported by $2.27 million in revenue, which works out to a, a cost recovery percentage of roughly 57%. The analysis worked with all the departments to increase those fees and improve the cost recovery. And we've proposed a year one cost recovery of 3.35 million, which is an increase of a million dollars over the prior revenues that supported those fee activities. For the four departments you see on the screen there, the majority of what planning and community development do is supported by fees, less so for public works, fire and economic development. What we did for methodology is we, we break every, everything down, all the costs of each of those departments into a, a fully burdened hourly rate. Uh, it's the personnel costs and the overhead, both the overhead from the department itself as well as some citywide costs that support the fee departments. Uh, we calculate that full cost of the fee by multiplying the personnel cost times the time spent to provide the services to the public. We compare those costs to the fees received and have a by fee cost recovery for every single fee in each department's list of fees. So we identified uh, the fees with the departments, completed the analysis, worked with the departments to understand the impacts of those fees and charges on the public. And they se selected a percentage of cost recovery to recommend uh, for each fee. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back over to staff to uh, continue the presentation. I'll be here for questions as well. Thank you, sir. So part of the phase two proposed um, by the department, so we have a couple updates across uh, these departments here. So first in blue, we have economic development participating, fire department, public works, planning community development department. We also have additional studies that we brought forth uh, for you later this December. Um, that includes the finance department's merchant fees, fire department's uh, first responder public safety impact, public works, and uh, parks and rec. The additional update is for the current planning fees under planning department. Um, we are proposing to bring forth five fees that were studied in phase one since 2017 have not yet reached 100% cost recovery and therefore that is also part of our recommendation to bring them to 100% cost recovery on January 1st. For the finance department, um, there are three updates we are proposing. It is to update the title to the citywide fee schedule or fee schedule for short, as well as updating web links to the schedule so it references um, additional fee schedules from Parks and Rag and Water and then lastly is to update annually in January. For the Department of Economic Development and Housing, there are 45, uh, so we are projected a 21% increase in revenue of about $8,000 increase. There are 10 fee updates across four categories, which includes adding um, an additional fee for land use agreements review and the fees for parklet applications uh, will remain subsidized. For the fire department, we have the marine safety fees. There were 13 fees updated across the four categories, which would result in 16% increase in revenue, about $3,000 increase. The fees that will remain subsidized are for nonprofits. For the prevention schedule of the fire department as well, we updated 103 fees across four categories with an estimated increase of 69% for an increase of 104, sorry, excuse me, $240,000. 
uh, we did some consolidation of the fees instead of breaking the square footages down by building type, such as commercial residential, we uh, created a range of the square footage. For the Public Works Engineering Division, uh, we updated 81 fees across seven categories, which would result in 37% increase in revenue of about $340,000. We uh, added some fees for stormwater and also updated some development services fees. For the Planning and Community Development Department Building and Safety Division, we updated 157 fees across 13 categories, and this would result in a 52% increase of about $480,000 uh, increase in revenue in year one. We are taking a phased in approach across uh, three categories for 60% cost recovery, 80% cost recovery, and 100% cost recovery. Meaning that any fees that are less than 60% cost recovery in year one, we would bump it up to 80% in year two, 100% cost recovery in year three. For fees that are between 60% and 80% cost recovery, currently we are bumping them up to 80% cost recovery in year one and 100% cost recovery in year two. And lastly, for fees that are between 81% to 100% cost recovery, bring them, bringing them up to 100% cost recovery in year one. So this phased in approach um, is intended to alleviate any uh, large rent uh, oh, alleviate any increases. Lastly, for phase two, we have additional studies that we will be bringing forth to you in December. Um, the first one is for Parks and Rec to um, review additional excise tax. Um, second is for the fire department, along with the uh, police department, where you will be updating the public safety uh, impact fee. And by direction of city council, the planning and community development department will also return with the child care impact fee to review the exemption of affordability restrictions. For fire, they're also proposing to bring forth a first responder fee that probably will come to you around spring of 2025. Public Works is also reviewing the sidewalk uh, in lieu fee and aerial undergrounding, and finance will be reviewing citywide merchant fees for a convenience fee program. And of course, for the past year, uh, there have been a lot of meetings with various staff members across these departments. And so I'd like to especially recognize these staff members who have participated in the fee study update, as well as the MGT Impact Solutions team. And myself and the departments are available to answer City Council's questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Pearson. Questions, comments by members? The Vice Mayor is recognized. Thank you for your presentation. I think this is really important in um, keeping our city fully funded. I do have a question. Did I? What did I hear you say about nonprofits? The fees for the marine safety of the fire department will remain subsidized because they're fees that nonprofits would apply for. Okay. Um, and this maybe is a more specific question, but it comes back to a, a meeting that um, Director Butler and I had with the city schools project. And I'm wondering how they fit into this. As, as people are aware, over um, at the old Natural Bridges campus, there's some uh, workforce housing that's underway, and I'm wondering if Lee can speak to that in terms of Wonder why that came specific qu questions, and, it, and it's specifically around like you know parks or um, child care impact and, and how we want to continue to encourage other you know, em large employers to develop workforce housing. What kind of, what kind of what room will we have with those partners? Mr. Butler on the principal's question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Keeley and uh, Vice Mayor Golder. Um, so the, um, the impact fees as currently structured, um, they do apply to, um, to all projects. Um, there is a provision in the municipal code um, that has some uh, additional allowances. Um, first off, um, the child care and the public safety impact fees, um, those do not currently apply to 100% affordable projects. Um, and that is something that um, we will be bringing to the council in December um, because the, the council has asked that um, we reevaluate that. And, um, and so that will be an option for the council to, to consider in December is whether or not to apply those fees to 100% um, affordable projects or not. Um, second, 
there is a provision in the municipal code that um, does allow for um, consideration of reduced fees for affordable housing. And um, we have um, historically only applied that to 100% affordable projects. And um, so uh, the, uh, the past practice um, has been um, those 100% affordable projects can make a request that ultimately goes to the city council. The city council makes the decision. The way that is worded is it, it, it can only apply to the affordable units. But as I mentioned, we have only applied it to 100% affordable projects. Okay. You see where I'm going. But I... I think to, to address where I think you're going, um, the council... Um, uh, based on the project that the uh, school district has, which does include some uh, that are um, not um, considered affordable, if, if I recall correctly, some that are above the 120% of area median income. That would require a uh, code change um, for um, fees, like impact fees or other fees um, to not be uh, applied. I, I, I wonder if there's an opportunity here. I think of other large employers like Metro or Dignity Health or PAM for Kaiser, um, certainly the university and, and other places where we want to encourage them to address kind of the missing middle. I know that we have a lot of um, affordable at all income levels coming in, but the people that are really working and supporting the backbone of our community I'd love to see more of those type of projects coming through. And so I don't know if there's a way to talk about that here now or if any recommendations you can make where we could say if it's a project for um, where they can be considered affordable and they can apply for waivers or something like that or if it would completely circumvent. But I don't think there'd be a large number of these projects. But in order to encourage them, having some sort of like carrot or offering might help some of the um, development moving forward. That's I, wonder, kind of my I wonder if what might work is you're going, not you, and there will be a, a, a report back here in December, uh, next phase of, of this. Could the gentlelady's question be included in that report in December? Could you address that in December? I'm asking really, if you would just let me look over here. Can we do that in December? Mr. Butler, work for you. Yes, that, that's fine. I would say that you, um, Madam Vice Chair. <clears throat> the, okay. the question that I would have um, for the council is if the council is interested, you could um, provide direction either by motion or you know, just by um, the, the observation of <laughs> your reactions. <laughs> um, we could include, we could develop a code change that would um, uh, address workforce housing. Um, or we could bring back that for further discussion at the December hearing. Um, I, I wonder if that might be what we're looking for here is that. And the second part is, is looking at that in December as opposed to giving direction now of a policy nature. Ms. Can I ask Ms. Yeah, Brown? I was going to say, I would certainly prefer moment. that. And I'd Ms. Prefer Brown on the question. Yeah, yeah, that would be my preference. I think okay. there are some a, a good number of questions, and it's a really good point you've made, um, but there's a difference between public and private sector, big employers and things like that. So just to put it out, to include that, I think that makes sense. Thanks. Okay, without objection, when we get to a motion, that'll be in the motion, I, I suspect. All right. Uh, further questions or comments? Yes, Ms. Watkins. In regards to some of the, like, the exemptions for the, like, 100% affordable housing, right, one of the things that I've observed is that, for example, some of the projects that have been entitled are now being purchased by other developers who are going to then draw on state dollars, right, to be able to make it higher, more mm -hmm. dense, and affordable. So that's partially why I think it makes sense to have a consideration around, like, in applying the, those types of fees to those types of, of um, developers and developments. And I'm wondering if you want to speak to that or if that's confirmed in terms of my observation. Uh, sure. What I would say related to that is um, you know, we have um, had quite a bit of success in getting 100% affordable projects moving forward. We um, are just opening in the last week or two the um, 70 units of affordable housing at PAC Station South and have 
Pack Station North um, uh, under construction and the Cedar Center apartments. Um, all of those um, uh, you know, would have contributed substantial sums of money to our, um, our impact fees as it relates to public safety and child care. So there's certainly an opportunity cost there, and there is a, um, a, a demand um, for both child care services and public safety services resulting from those. Um, I, I think it's, it's a policy question. Um, you know, when those projects come through, they are certainly, um, you know, scraping every penny to, to make sure that they can get funded, and um, there are demands that they continue to create. Um, with the um, analysis that we're bringing in December, what we'll plan to do is um, show the council um, with those past projects and with the projects that we have um, coming up anticipated, here's what um, the revenues would be at 25%, 50%, 75%, and 100% of the fees. And um, then that gives council an understanding of how much those would be paying and how much we would get in the future for some of the projects that we have lined up. And if there are any additional data points that the council would like, we're um, happy to um, help provide that information and feel free to reach out to myself um, either um, you know, after this meeting or if you've got additional things that you have thought of now, feel free to um, uh, provide that information and feedback. No, I, pre I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm certainly interested in seeing that increase or be applied to affordable housing units. I think it is an impact. There is a mass amount of them being produced, and they're able to draw on a lot of resources financially to make their projects pencil. So I think it does make a lot of sense. I know that also in the past we've had conversations about Nexus studies and other studies that really show that when you have this type of development, there is an impact to community and infrastructure, et cetera. Are there any potential areas in which we're not addressing in this proposal that you feel would be um, worthwhile to explore and if so what would those be that's a great question um, I think um, the the fire department can speak to this separately but um, my understanding is they're looking at the um, public safety impact fee and looking at updating that based on the additional assumptions that they have for infrastructure needs over the next 10 or so years um, You'll recall, Councilmember Watkins, it's been four years or so, five maybe, since we adopted that um, uh, public safety impact fee, and you know those um, those resource demands change, and so that's one of the areas that we are um, being proactive. Um, the other thing that I would say is, um, from a transportation perspective, you know, we're uh, contemplating how we look at our transportation network and. Um, our transportation impact fee, uh, I think we will be looking at how that is revised in the future. Um, and it's largely focused on um, vehicular traffic movement now and having a greater focus on pedestrian and bicycle enhancements, I think is something that uh, presents an opportunity for us to look at uh, changing how we do business in the future. And your points, your question is a really good one, and I, I think um, those are the ones that jump to mind, um, but it's also something that I think it's important for myself and all the departments really to uh, think critically about to understand um, how the infrastructure needs in each department um, could potentially be uh, funded through new impact fees. And would a next step be essentially to request a nexus study or um, staff to present to the council a nexus study package of potential fees to explore for either increase or additions? So that, that uh, public safety impact fee update is underway. Um, uh, we have initiated some conversations with the, um, the Public Works Department about transportation fees, and so I think um, probably early next year we'll be um, talking with the council to um, uh, get direction to um, look at those new impact fees. Um, with respect to others, if any council members have ideas, feel free to reach out to either myself or the applicable department head, and um, then we can look at the next steps, whether that would be coming to council and getting um, a uh, direction to proceed um, or um, directly engaging with a, um, a consultant to work on that uh, nexus study. We, when we do the impact fees, you're correct, we do have to um, prepare those nexus studies in advance and then um, make sure that the, the 
impact is tied to the fee and that the fee is proportional to the impact. Yeah, I think that there's probably really good data from some of your community outreach events around some of the projects that are being proposed around potential foreseeable impacts that you could probably draw on to help inform some of these potential nexus studies that could go to supporting some of these impacts. But um, yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Brunner is recognized. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to um, continue that thread and that um, this Wednesday is the city's public safety committee meeting at 430. And this is one of the agenda items that will be discussed. And in the staff report that's posted, the city contracted with a public finance development economics and clean energy bond consulting firm to review the public safety impact fees and exemption for 100% affordable housing. They've provided a draft report with their recommendations, which will be outlined and discussed. Fire and police will have a presentation and it will be brought forth on the December 10th city council meeting to seek further discussion and potential commission approval. Um, so that will be continued. For the debate or uh, excuse me, for their initial comments. Uh, if I could ask uh, perhaps if, uh, whoever prepared uh, table one on page four, uh, 20.4, annualized costs and revenues a years, one for city user fee program, et cetera. Tell me when you're there and I'll be. Thank you. So as I understand this table, it indicates user category by user category what in effect is our costs of providing service, a fee associated with that, a, pro a proposed set of increases in those fees to more fully recover 100% of our costs. Correct, we're okay so far? Correct, so some of the fees, uh, the departments have decided to not recover 100% of them, um, right. so they are uh, differentiated. Right, so uh, if I understand it, uh, take a look at the column F, that is the increase in each of the fees by department. If we look at uh, column D, uh, that indicates uh, the cost recovery policy. So in effect, we are recovering, if we adopt this, we will be recovering quite a bit of our costs of providing these services from the people who are asking for those services. And if I understand, you, you and I have been through this years ago, um, the difference as I understand it between a fee and a tax is that a fee is for a service which is voluntary on the part of the person who is being asked to pay the fee. This is not something uh, that they're voluntarily deciding I'm going to be uh, you know, developing something or or engage in an activity that's 100 percent voluntary by the person who's doing it and so we can then in that context charge 100 percent of the cost of providing that to that person who voluntarily is asking for this a tax on the other hand is involuntary someone has to pay that tax it doesn't matter if they want to or don't want to it's not a voluntary choice uh, and for that, they can expect, quite frankly, nothing directly in return for it. That's how a tax works. You may get a return on that. You may get some benefit, but that's not what a tax is. A tax is an involuntary payment, and you can expect no relationship between what you pay and what you get back. A fee, you can expect direct relationship, what you're paying and what you get for that. So if that's still true, then Poor city council colleagues have to hear me every time on this basic concept, and that is I believe in 100% cost recovery. Uh, I'm a jealous guardian of the general fund, and so I have a question every time we provide one penny of subsidy on a fee, why are we doing that? 
why are we not getting 100 percent cost recovery? Those are policy choices, but they have millions of dollars of consequences for our general fund. So my question then is, you'll never guess in a million years, uh, why at this stage, because I understand we have a plan over time, try to get that, why wouldn't we do that today? I think that's a great question, Mayor. Thank you. <laughs> I think most of the departments have chosen to receive, uh, to go towards a 100% cost recovery approach with the exception of the Planning and Community Development Department. The building fees haven't been studied since 1997. Um, it's been a while, and so we wanted to be cognizant of the community members who are receiving these service or user fees to be able to to, to apply, and we don't want to disincentivize, for example, a water uh, heater permit. Um, we don't want to charge necessarily a full 100% cost recovery yet um, to disincentivize others who otherwise might see that it's too expensive and then therefore uh, result in a safety hazard potentially. Let me ask the department who is dealing with that specific issue. Chief, is that you? Is that you, sir, Mr. Mr. Gerberson, is this you on this precise point? Uh, I was one of the Here, come on, okay, get the microphone. There we go. Yes, I was one of the deciders on that point. To gradually institute the increases, therefore not disenfranchising some of the um, uh, the citizens of the community and coming in and pulling permits for things like water heaters, um, electrical panel upgrades, you know, to gradually recover those costs over the three years. So I understand that from a policy perspective, mm -hmm. but I, the other way I think to look at that is in three years somebody's going to pay that and we're going to stop subsidizing it. Uh, really what I'm doing, I'm Keep in mind here, the artifice I'm creating here is I'm talking to my colleagues, okay? That's what I'm doing here. <laughs> so <laughs> they know that and you know that. Uh, my desire is to recover these faster. Um, we have great pressures on the general fund. We Voters agreed to, to increase the sales tax, increase our general fund. We've got all kinds of cost increases in our employee contracts that are, that are coming up. Uh, I'm interested in uh, cost recovery much quicker than a three-year plan. So thank you very much for that. Now let me see if there are questions or comments from other members of the council. Seeing and hearing none, let's go out to the, to the public, see if there are questions or comments on this item. Seeing and hearing none, matters back before the body for action. Sure. A motion okay. would be a good idea. All right. Well, I'll <laughs> make a motion um, to move the staff recommendation um, and maybe not do the three years. Have it be, I'm looking at Matt wants to say something, mid-motion. Um, if I may. Yes. I um, appreciate that, uh, that motion, uh, Vice Mayor Golder. Um, to the mayor's point, it's completely at the council's discretion. So what staff has brought forward is a little bit of a... Um, approach mm -hmm. a soft mm -hmm. runway uh, to eventually get to 100% but if the council is interested in accelerating that and perhaps starting at 80 and moving to 100% uh, in the subsequent year rather than a, a three-year runway uh, that's certainly a direction that we would welcome if there's interest thank you mr. city manager thank Madam you. vice mayor you're thank recognized. you um, so I will move the staff recommendation and I will make an edit where rather than the phased approach, we'll go to a, a two year starting at 80 and then doing 100 the second year. Um, and with some added direction around looking at some workforce housing projects that are also paid for from another tax base, which is us out of our. Uh, on. So second. I'll second. There's a second. Uh, on your on your motion, Madam Vice Chair, you may open. Excuse me, Madam Vice Mayor, you may open. I thank you. I, I don't have a lot to say. I kind of already said what I had to say, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Ms. Watkins, on Maybe the motion. May I have a friendly amendment that we also Certainly. add direction for staff to present to us more information about possible nexus studies that could um, outline impacts of development and recommendations as to how to potentially pursue those. Agreeable to make a agreeable second motion. Uh, you are the second, I believe. And is I that agree. correct? So yes. you, you, you <laughs> can agree with agreeable. yourself? Okay, there we go. Good enough. So uh, further on the motion? Ms. Brown on the motion. Just briefly, I will say, uh, you know, I'm going to support the motion. I appreciate the interest in accelerating this timeline. I recognize this will be, um, you know, uh, a hit for people who are in, 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 in the process or about to engage in the process of pulling permits uh, through planning. But um, I want to remind us all that the full cost recovery policy was adopted in 2017. And this, and, I, and I'm not, no judgment about the time it's taken to come back to us with some of these, and this is a phase two, um, but that's a long time. So we've, as a city, said we want to recover those costs, and we haven't been doing that. <laughs> so I, uh, I think that accelerating the timeline makes sense and appreciate all the work that's gone into it. It's a long time coming. Thanks. For the debate or discussion, seeing here none, the clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom. Aye. Brown. Aye. Watkins. Aye. Bruner. Aye. Valentari Johnson. Aye. Vice Mayor Golder. Aye. Mayor Keeley. Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Madam Bush, uh, Madam uh, Clerk, do we have uh, for the business come before us? Not for me, no. City Attorney, for the business come no before us? No further business. Seen here none. The Vice Mayor, in order to make up for not being here the entire day, <laughs> uh, moves to adjourn, yeah. non debatable. Uh, second by Mr. Newsom, who wants to add that he was very pleased with the outcome of the Tennessee game this last Saturday. White. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, aye. motion carries in order. We stand adjourned. Recording stopped. Why are you racing me today? Thank you. Oh, yeah.